cave dwellers hunted the horse for food. But as humankind evolved, so did its relationship with the horse. Humans began to see the horse as a noble creature, a loyal servant, and a true companion. And so it has been. For 5,000 years, the horse running with us through different lands and civilizations, through time and experience. Today, the services of the horse have been greatly diminished, but the bond between horse and human has never been stronger. Join us as we examine this fascinating relationship in a six-part series, The Horse. I've been over there fighting the jump right there, so you classically Human experience has included the horse for as long as we care to remember. And today, what can this long-serving, faithful companion expect from the two-legged mammal that became its master and protector? Being with them is so soothing. It offers you such a feeling of safety and love, unconditional love. I have a, a very competent man, the farrier, that comes to take care of my horses, and they're on a schedule every six weeks. What I do with horses is essentially allow people to learn about themselves by working with horses on the ground. Let's take a look at the horses among us and how we treat them. The horse, an animal we know today as a friend and companion, but throughout history it has played many different roles. In the beginning, horses avoided humans. Only as time passed did they come to work for and with their former predator. And likely one of their first and enduring jobs was to help humans feed themselves, hunting for food and tilling the soil a role they played well into the 20th century. It didn't take long either for horses to show how efficiently their muscular bodies and hardy legs could pull heavy loads, even in the most demanding of circumstances. As a means of transportation, the horse took civilizations from crude sled to primitive backpack to the wheeled carriage. It's no surprise that once the horse proved itself a dependable means of transportation, there was another vital role for this faithful working partner. Men everywhere were fighting wars, and what better way to take on your attacker or your prey than mounted on a swift, sure-footed beast twice as tall and ten times the weight of the average foot soldier. Horses were not warriors, but they fought and died with them, and sometimes may have shared the glory of victory. But war was a cruel endeavor, condemning many horses to the worst treatment they had ever received in the service of their master. 
Those who returned from war resumed their traditional jobs, mostly in the form of transportation. But even that soon came to an end, and the horse lost much of its practical value. Horses are still with us, a few even remaining on the open plain or on the ranch. But today, most horses are athletes, entertainers, or pets. For the horse, the line between sport and entertainment is at best a fuzzy one. The rodeo is a good example. With its roots in the cattle and horse ranching traditions of the West, the rodeo is a popular spectacle of strength, speed and agility. The main rodeo events, like competitive riding, require horse and rider to be in top athletic shape. In the bronco riding event, horse and rider are pitted against each other in one of the most physically demanding sports ever devised. Rodeo people are anxious to alleviate concerns some horse lovers may have about the treatment of bronco horses. They are athletes. A lot of people think that the buck and flank uh, strap makes them buck. Well, you can't uh, force a horse to do something in any event. If it doesn't come from their heart, well, they're never going to be the best at what they're doing. And in rodeo, if you want to put on good rodeo, well, you need good horse. Then you need good bucking horse. You've got to go through 10 colts from a breeding programs to get a real rodeo athlete. So if the horse likes the game, then you realize, like, if I kick, that thing that's on my back is going to go away. Then that's where we start to make him like it. According to Sylvain, one of the keys to making sure horses are not treated badly in the bronco riding sports is to breed the animal specifically for that sport, to make sure they actually get a thrill out of throwing a man into the air. As he says, if the horse doesn't like it, he doesn't get selected for the job. It's not a question of like, we're going to hurt him, he's going to jump. No, because if we hurt him, hey, then he's going to do it one, two times, and then he's going to quit. Because it's a lot easier for a horse to run away from something, because that, that's what they've got in their blood, their prey, right? So usually when they're scared of something, they run away. We show them a game, and if they like it, well, they're going to be good. If they got it, it, it's in their blood, same as in, in the cutting, in the barrel race. And you, you can breed the best barrel horse stud and the best barrel horse mare. It doesn't mean you're going to have a barrel racing champion. You can have like a barrel racing horse, but it doesn't mean he's going to be good. And when the horse is right for the sport, Sylvain prides himself on his rodeo's careful attention to the animal's physical well-being in the arena and behind the scenes. Harness racing is an age-old popular sport and a money-making industry. Riders, owners and sports fans all depending on the horse to win the prize and make the money. Business aside, what's it like for the horse out there on the track? What care is taken to make sure the racehorse is okay? A racehorse usually needs a lot more care, really. You can't just be thrown out in the, in the field and then taken to a race. He needs like the, the utmost care and he needs to always be, uh, like he needs his electrolytes and stuff to keep his everything going properly and he needs to be in top condition for racing. Just like an athlete, really. While fans of the sport see it as entertainment, those involved in horse racing know that certain measures have to be met in order for the horse to stay healthy. A lot of them, you know, when they get up older in age, they don't need a lot of conditioning. Instead of actually training them in between the weeks, you might just jog them a few light miles. Where younger horses, you'll have to keep tykes or muscles are not used to being actually that condition for that long. So you actually have to jog them a few days a week while they're racing and train them also. It also means proper diet and proper conditioning. This is the bridle that just goes over. Getting the young animal used to the harness and the handlers is also an important part of preparing the horse to race. Pretty much most of them have never been handled with a yearling. You want to start in the fall to actually race at midsummer. So it, it'll, it'll take you, you know, eight months to get a two-year-old 
down in training if you want to actually keep it healthy and strong. So you don't want to rush them too much, especially with the young horses, because they're still growing and they can injure themselves and their bones aren't fully developed, and the same with their muscles and everything else. It's always important for handlers to be in tune with each horse. That way, if anything goes wrong or something doesn't feel right, they're able to act on it in time to prevent serious harm. The, the horse will usually let you know, like his, uh, his stride will be a little different. He'll look sore, like if he's sore up front, he'll kind of have a head nod and things like that. There's all different kinds of signs. And a good, a good trainer, like the, the guy that looks after the stable and all the horses, all the race horses, is, he's, uh, he's the trainer, so he usually, ha he'll have a good or she will have a good eye for whatever the, whatever's wrong with the horse and can usually pick it out pretty good. And if, if they have a, even an idea, then they'll get the vet in and just get a second opinion then too. Another example of horse entertainment is the RCMP musical ride. Inspector Bruce Willens ensures that each horse receives the best of training and treatment throughout its career as a musical ride horse. The horses we use in the musical ride are brought into Ottawa from our breeding ranch at age three. At age three, we start a three-year training program of the horse, so it takes approximately three years for the horse to be prepared for the musical ride. The Mounties are the riders, of course. It takes them six months to train for the musical ride, so the Mounties are a little bit smarter than the horse. Ride canter. The horses at age six are then transferred once they're fully trained to the musical ride. They come to my, uh, my portion of the ride and we start traveling around the world with them. We like to have the horses on the ride for about 10 years, but actually what determines how long they stay with it is their health. When they become having problems, when we get older, we all have the problems with our joints or whatever. It's the same thing with a horse. And when that starts to happen and the horse is on medications, whatever, for arthritis or rheumatism, we bring them, bring them over to our equitation training unit, which of course is used for training the young riders that are coming in. That way we keep them in Ottawa, extend their lifespan, and use them on a day-to-day -day basis as well. When the horse is starting to suffer, with that type, we call on the vet and have them put down humanely. Sometimes we have a horse 23, 24 years old, that is not uh, on any medications, but certainly is a good age for, for a musical ride horse. They've been on our training staff because we don't want to take them on the road with us and extend them through the travel and that stress. So they've been training on riders for many years, but they're no longer suitable for being ridden three hours a day, day in, day out. What we have done in recent years is donate these horses to uh, therapeutic riding associations which these are horses are bomb proof, they're well suited for the program, they're healthy, they're not on medications, and most of the therapeutic riding associations are non-profit and don't have a lot of funds for those to maintain a horse. So that's what we do with some of the older horses. It's, it's a nice way for retirement. Long ago, we chose the horse to be our companion and servant. Over time, we've learned more and more how to attend to the needs of these animals that have contributed so much to our lives on so many levels. A more caring attitude makes a real difference. For some horses, it's not just a matter of comfort and security, but one of life and death. When the treatment of horses sinks to an unacceptable level, it takes humane, horse-loving people to act to get involved and see to it that a horse is saved from neglect or poor treatment. At Belgian Cross that we now have, he was actually a rescue horse. I never saw the hooves on that horse until after he was loaded in the trailer. He was being kept in a, an alder bed, being fed uh, scraps, you know, from uh, uh, old bread and that type of thing. And uh, so given the nature of the breed, uh, my interest in horses and trying to help an animal that uh, needed help. We made the decision, or I should say I made the decision on a Friday to buy the horse. There was no fence around where we are right now. And by Sunday, three o'clock, the horse was here with a fence. So uh, it all happened very quick. 
this is Sparrow and she is a paint cross. Don't quite know what her breeding is. And she came to me in a rescue situation. I was asked to check on her by the SPCA who'd been getting some calls about a horse that was being left in a field with a very serious wound. And I um, went and saw her and she had a wound that started here and went right around her uh, leg and up the back there. And it had been caused by a rope tied to a collar. When she was staked out, she had panicked and run and the rope had worked itself into her flesh. And she just was in a situation where they were kind of letting her heal or not in the field without any direct care every day. And I considered that pretty unacceptable. And I managed to buy her um, and take her, take her home. And it was a good four months of work before the tissue sort of grew out from that wound. You know, she's a challenging horse. I've, I've tried to get on her a few times and a successful ride on Sparrow is about 30 seconds. You get on, you, you uh, wait till she breathes and you get off. And that's how I'm gonna build it over time because she, she has a threshold, you know, and if you cross that threshold and push her too much, she'll just get dangerous, you know. So as long as you're um, in the comfort zone and in her comfort zone, she's actually extremely uh, willing to do lots of things. Um, here in the background is um, Unfortunate Lady. She's number 455 in the registry. She's a rescue mare. Her previous owner left her in care of an unexperienced horse person. And um, she was in her stall. She uh, tied on with a rope and she chewed through the rope and escaped. And when they found her, they put her back in her stall, only this time they tied her on with um, a clothesline wire, you know, the plastic coated. And they had it way too long. It was about, I'd say, eight feet long and it got tangled up behind her legs. She still has the scar and she fell down in her, in her side stall and twisted her neck. Her condition is permanent, but it, it has not hindered her ability to produce. These horses were fortunate to be rescued from substandard conditions and treatment. But what standards of care are conscientious horse owners applying these days? Someone once said, if you want to know how a horse is treated, check the barn in which it lives. Cynthia and Keith built their barn to the best standards they could find. Initially, the reason why we moved out where we are, uh, we, look, we were always looking for a uh, small acreage for a number of acres because Cynthia wanted to have horses. And uh, when we found this piece of land initially some 20 years ago, the intention was then to have a barn and horses. And it just took a while for us to get here. Cynthia searched magazines and internet sites hunting for designs and health and safety guidelines, everything she could find out about horse barns. She drew up a floor plan for her barn that she felt would provide her two horses the best in comfort and security. You know, for a, a smaller horse like Diana, who's, you know, probably 14-1 height, and this guy, he's going to be 16 hands when he's finished growing, so he's only a year old. It's nice for them to have a space that they can actually comfortably lie down. There's also what's been common for many years. A lot of horses have standing stalls where they're tied. They can still lie down, but they can't really move around that much because they're tied to the front of their stall. And that's quite a common practice for a lot of even draft horses. Box stalls give them a little bit more opportunity to move around and, and rest more comfortably. Cynthia wanted her structure to be draft free, but she also wanted her horses to have lots of fresh air. They kind of made fun of me when I <laughs> designed it, thinking I had too many doors. But it's nice that with our stalls, we have half doors so that if the weather's not all that great on some days, we can just open half doors so they can still get a chance to look out. And it also cuts down on the boredom because I think if they have a chance to look out their, their windows and look around, they don't spend as much time just chewing or stall walking and things like that. The main thing is to have a shelter for bad weather and cold weather. Uh, it's also important horses get out as much as possible outside in the fresh air. 
So we try to keep them out when the weather permits as long as possible. And if it's warm enough, you can keep them out. Uh, many people keep them out 24-7, just providing a shelter that they can go in when they want. But the size is just one of the many things to consider when building a barn. The structure of the barn has to be draft-free while also providing plenty of ventilation. The barn itself can create breathing hazards that put horses' lungs and breathing passages at risk. Ventilation cuts down the risk of the horse getting sick. With a lot of the respiratory problems, it starts out with no air circulation and dust from either just the barn, from the sawdust, from hay that's a bit... Hay can be very dusty from just regular dust, and then you get some hay that gets a little musty and moldy. And that really causes a lot of problems with horses when they in ingest or inhale spores from the mold dust in hay. It's, it's been a labor of love. You wouldn't spend the time helping other people do it as you would do it for yourself. It's, it's a lot of work, and of course you had to be ready for it. You can't have the horse until you have everything else done. So it's also incentive. They're not showing any signs of stress. They look very relaxed. Come down in the evenings. Uh, we don't do it very often, but every once in a while, we might have to come down 10 or 11, say 10 or 10.30. This guy behind us is lying down asleep, you know, stretched out full length in the stall. Well, that's, that's kind of a nice little indication that they're pretty comfortable where they are, and they've got the room to stretch out. And, you know, that just the contentment that they show is, is the reward that you get for the, the work that you've done. Planning a living space for a horse doesn't end in the barn. Fencing is another aspect that has to be carefully considered. Several kilometers away, another well-constructed barn shelters a couple of other contented horses. The, the maintenance part and stable management is important. Mucking out the stalls, we don't want our horses in there walking around in their manure and in their urine. We don't want that uh, getting in their feet. Floors, as you can see, are swept on a routine basis to keep the mess uh, cleaned up. Nice airflow here. When we uh, talked about designing the barn, we sat down, we had n numerous meetings about what we wanted. Something that was good, not for us so much, but more importantly for the horses. These guys are the important part here. We are the second place guys here. It's just, it's a really, really good uh, stable. It's, uh, it's clean. It's, uh, people are surprised when they walk in here and say they can't get over how clean it is, but it is a, a mounted unit for our force. Uh, we take pride in keeping the animals clean, and in, this is our home, so we have to uh, keep it clean. The same dedicated care for their horses' living quarters permeates everything these proud policemen do for their equine charges. Through the ages, humans have devised for horses an assortment of apparel and body devices. Some are intended for the horse's protection, and others meant to improve the horse's efficiency on the job. One of the oldest and most universal pieces of horse hardware is the horseshoe. Right now I'm just going to clean the dirt outside and haul the shoe off. The makeup of the foot is just like your own fingernail, but a lot harder, basically. And like it has its sensitive points in it, where if you trim or drive a nail in the wrong spot, you can seriously injure the horse. Horses wear shoes to protect their feet from getting more down too much when they're out working, like on the roads or just out for a ride, and keep them from going sore. Well, there's a saying in the horse business, no feet, no horse. Well, there are some people that believe that uh, putting shoes on horses is a foreign entity to them and everything else like this. I totally disagree. These animals are, are prone to be hurt. If, for an example, you're riding a, a horse with no shoes and you break the wall or the side of his hoof, you could have trouble for the rest of the horse's life. And when you do decide to do justice by the animal by putting shoes on them, the wall is broken away or there's an injury there, so. I shoe my horses every six weeks. I have a, a very competent man, the farrier, that comes to take care of my horses, and they're on a schedule every six weeks. Take the shoes off, trim them, make sure there's no foreign entities, you know, problems with the horse. Come on. <laughs> 
Come on now, don't you? You want a scratch? You want to scratch? You want a scratch? Okay, scratch. Although evidently horse people disagree about the horseshoe, you can hear in their reasoning that what they do care about is the horse's welfare. Similar differences of opinion arise with other horse hardware. The steel rod part of the head tackle, which spans the horse's mouth and is used by the rider for controlling the horse. How much are these adorable? Oh, the horseware of Ireland's come out with a bridle, almost, um, almost the same idea as the bitless bridle that's starting to come out a lot in Ontario. And it, it, they're, developing a bridle that is non-evasive to a horse's face. The horse has very sensitive, thin bones coming down their nose and a regular nose band. When you crank that shut to apply a, a training device, you're risking breaking the nose. The, they also rub on the molars, just like humans. The horse's top teeth are wider than the bottom, so then you create problems with their gums and. So they're coming out with a whole newly designed bridle that you can still put a bit in so it doesn't, it's not a bitless, but the whole leather work is just totally alleviating any pressure points on the horse's face. And what horse has not had to don the familiar blinkers or blinders? Not as intrusive as some other devices, but not necessarily the horse's first choice of headwear. Controversial or not, there is no getting away from the preponderance of hardware in a domestic horse's life. But the discussion does reflect how people are becoming more conscious of the details that affect a horse's comfort and well-being. For the day-to-day -day health management, owners can get along most of the time without professional help. But there are some kinds of care that a vet does best. So has she been any worse with the hot, muggy weather, or has she been pretty much the same? It's been about the same. same. For a physical examination or administering a drug, or actually mending a wound, the doctor for large animals is the one that the conscientious horse owner calls. The veterinarian, a key person in the modern day care of a horse. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not out either before breakfast or, or after supper to, to see a horse. And then of course you have uh, the emergency calls that come at any time of the day or night. My practice in rural Newfoundland is not associated with a, a hospital. We don't have a facility for doing any work on premises. So everything that I do is in the field. Any surgery that I do will be in the farmer's field. And it's sometimes a bit of a challenge to find a place that's clean place where there's no rocks for a horse to hit its head when we put it down with an anesthetic. Those kinds of things are always challenges for us. Horses are subject to ailments like colic, thrush and heaves. Some more prone than others, depending on day-to-day -day occupation and circumstances. Most times with the horses, and especially in this area of the province, we see generalized you know, physical exams, annual consults where we do overall well-being for the horse. We take care of their teeth, we give them their vaccinations, we make sure they're healthy. Otherwise, you can see horses for a variety of reasons. Sometimes you'll see them because they're on sound or they're lame and we need to look and see if there's anything wrong with them, if they've hurt themselves and that kind of thing. Otherwise, as well, you see horses when they're ill and when they're ill, sometimes they can have colic, which is a uh, an abdominal pain in a horse, which can be for many different reasons. That's usually an emergency we see. The horses that are taxed the least, such as those who spend most of their day in the pasture, will likely avoid most of the common ailments. But even pastured horses encounter health challenges. And some emergencies call for surgery. Probably the most difficult surgery that I've ever done is I uh, attempted a cesarean section in a horse one time. Um, it's not something that really is uh, plausible to do in the kind of practice that I have. But sometimes we're in rural areas with the next referral practice across uh, the ocean partway, you do what you can do. As well as that, there are most of the surgeries that I would do would be uh, trauma repair surgeries. Animals have been cut, sewing up uh, big gashes in them. And some of them can be quite major. Anything you can do in human medicine, you can do in the vet profession as well. So usually we do courses on things such as lameness, uh, diseases that can affect the horse. We take courses in ophthalmology, the eyes. We do courses in dentistry. 
We do courses in parasitology, parasites, and you can pretty much do courses in everything. There's something for every part of the horse. Dr. Peacock has seen it all, the mild and severe. And he's had the unpleasant duty of bringing it all to an end for a failing horse. It's important that the decision to euthanize a horse is made for the horse and not made for the person. There's always a temptation, if you've got an animal that's suffering, that you don't want to go through the heartbreak of, of putting your horse down, as we say. And, and I always urge people to look at it from the, the side of the horse, not from the side of the owner. When people get very sick, there are all kinds of things we can do for palliative care for them, put them into hospitals, put them into beds. Those kinds of things really aren't available for horses. Horses can live to be in their 30s. When they die, it's often like losing a family member. Alan Malloy operates a pet cemetery and burial services business in St. John's, Newfoundland. He's often the first one contacted by the owner of a dying horse. Usually it's very, very simple. They want to have a dignified service for the pet. Somewhere they can put their pet, they know the pet is going to be safe. The only service we do provide for horses is burials. We don't have wakes per se. We often will have, though, uh, graveside services. The emotions Alan observes around the burial site reflect the intense bond between the people and their horses. There's no doubt he is assisting people in their loss of a loved one. People do get family members or their own ministers and at times to come by, have a family service at this graveside. A story with pets, uh, it's the Rainbow Bridge, where pets cross over the Rainbow Bridge. When they pass on and when their owner passes on, the horse is standing on or a pet is standing at the other side of the Rainbow Bridge for when they pass and they meet them there. And you know, that's the sort of thing where you know, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to the same place in the end, and so that, you know, you're going to meet your pet there eventually again. It helps comfort people, and, you know, basically I believe that too, so. The basic humane treatment of horses is something all genuine horse people aspire to. The story of how we care for our horses keeps evolving. People are discovering and developing whole new approaches for interaction between horses and people. And there are some who take the care of their horses to exceptional levels. Cynthia Mercer is one of them. It's really a gentle way of working with your horse. A lot of the T-touches are made of a combination of circles and lifts and uh, with, uh, done with the fingertips and very gentle. They're, they're something that they're not as invasive even as massage. They're very light and gentle. So a lot of horses with sore backs, a lot of the touches can help release a lot of tension and fear in their body. A lot of the issues that horses have are all based on tension, fear, and uh, if we can help them overcome those, we, we end up getting a much better behaved animal. And we also are more aware of the body and more aware of what's happening to them. They don't have to have a, a health issue, but it's really something nice that we can do with our horses to give them back for all the time they give us. It's also a way of training a horse that's a more gentle based and also working with the intelligence of the horse rather than just using force. Having them trust you and respect you and, and for you to respect them and trust them, it's, uh, it really has helped a lot. And what this does, it gives them a nice stretch all through the back and through the up through the pole, all the way through the back. So horses that have back problems, a lot of them really enjoy this. Let me do a very slow release. 
A lot of horses that have tension in the body have a very tight tail. So we'll take the tail and do some circles with the tail. We do a lot of circular touches and stretches, gentle stretches with the tail. Doing a lot of the touch work, especially the circular touches that, because it activated the brainwave patterns, you have an animal that's more focused and an animal that was more focused could learn easier and retain that learning a lot better. It's really nice to be able to give to that animal some, you know, some way to let them release a lot of pain and fear in their bodies. So it's uh, something that we can do for them just to make them feel good. Perhaps Cynthia is describing a standard of care for horses that has something for everybody to learn. Something to return to the horse that goes beyond just your acceptable humane treatment. A fairly recent development in the relationship between horses and people is the discovery of the horse's capacity to help people in need of healing. As we listen to horse lovers describe their involvement in this realm of the equestrian world, we can detect a dramatically elevated attitude toward the horse. What I do with horses is essentially um, allow people to, to uh, learn about themselves by working with horses on the ground. It's not traditional riding activities. It's using uh, the sensitivities that horses have to read people's states of mind and their emotional levels um, so that people can learn a little bit more about themselves by watching and experiencing the horses interacting with them. What I might do with someone is explore their emotional issues and why they were drawn to working with horses, what, they're, what they'd like to work on in their lives, what patterns they um, feel they're ready to change. And we start by choosing the horse that they work with is all done through their own intuition. Um, so my herd of six would be out and they, the, the client would come and simply spend time with each of the horses and notice their body reactions, notice whether they were, you know, attracted or repulsed or scared or, you know, laughed or however they were with these horses. And they would then note those down and we'd talk about them. And usually the horse that gives you the biggest charge or the horse that gives you no charge are both significant horses to work with. In working with her over the last couple of years, I've realized she has an amazing gift as well. Because she's so sensitive, she's a real barometer for people's levels of arousal themselves. So if you feel fear or you have a, an idea and you're sort of fixed in your head what you want, she will sense that and not want to be with you. If you're open to what happens and you're kind of um, clear about, you know, that you're just there and you're, you know, the, the state of mind that you're in, all those things, she's, she's perfectly happy to be with you. And one of the, the ways that you um, can find that out is by just noticing her breathing. Now she's eating and she's chewing now, which means that she's comfortable and she's um, able to be here and be present. If she got scared, her mouth would tense up and she'd stop breathing. And so it makes her very, very valuable in doing therapeutic work with people simply because if they understand that they have tension in their body, they can see that she's reflecting that tension in her. If they release it, she will release her tension. So it's a very, it's a, it's a great learning tool. Sarah doesn't try to be a psychiatrist. She just brings people together with horses, and the horses do their part by simply being the open, non-judgmental animals they are. Through a person-to-horse exchange, people are often able to straighten out their lives and come to feel better. It sounds like horses caring for us instead of us caring for them. Rhonda has also reached for the inner horse and has found ways to provide a healing connection for people she helps. As well as a, a horse person, I'm also a social worker for the last 30 odd years. And we have a program that tries to kind of combine horses and healing. 
and so we do psychotherapy using the horses. It's been very much proven across the states, through Canada, around the world, just this whole importance of horses and healing. And I guess, uh, just to explain a little bit about it, horses are an animal of prey. They mirror back very well human nature and human emotions. And one thing, I guess, for individuals who have, um, you know, had situations in their life which has been very detrimental to them, um, one of the things that horses give to people is non-judgment. When working with a horse, one of the really beautiful things is I can spend hours meeting with someone, say, on self-esteem in my office. And gradually we may help build their self-esteem. It's going to take a while. But within one hour up here, doing some of the work we do between a person and a horse, you will get the immediate wow moment, that immediate, oh my God, I did it. Yes, I can do it. You will get that feeling very quickly. And that's what makes this work so good. And sometimes the power of a horse is a totally personal thing. A turnaround in one's life that happens because of a horse. But when I was 28, I, I finally bought a horse. I was uh, working as a broadcast journalist at the time, and I had a lot of migraine headaches, and I was under a lot of stress. And I had a very good GP, and he said, you know, do you have any hobbies? I said, all I do is work and sleep. And he said, well, was there anything you did as a child that you were passionate about? And I said, oh yes, I said, horses. <laughs> and he said, well, I don't care what it costs, but I'm telling you, get a horse and your migraine headaches will go away. And by God, he was right. family but there's there I think life without animals would be pretty boring <laughs> you know and and I think animals just bring joy to your life what is wonderful about this field is that actually the horses really enjoy the work too because we're actually sort of becoming more horse-like when we do this work we're learning what the the nature of the horse how they deal with the world and we're learning from that people really can connect and learn from the animals about a part of their nature that isn't taught or isn't acknowledged in our society anymore. This recently discovered healing role for the horse shows our new level of appreciation and respect. It's a discovery that promises for the future an even richer bond between horses and people.